going here. Um, first thing in, in this is I, I need to go over some of the definitions. So this is why I wanted you to print this out and um, follow me along because I'll be using some of these uh, initials to represent things. The first one is PD, which means pituitary dysfunction. And don't worry if you don't know what a pituitary is, or even if you can pronounce it. Really, I don't want you to feel like you're stupid, or you can't follow things, or you're frustrated. That's not the point here. I will make sure that by the end of this, you'll be able to understand pituitary dysfunction and Cushing's disease and be able to talk to anybody about it reasonably well. That's my goal here tonight. So hang in there. If you don't follow it, you can always download this stuff later and follow along and read along. But anyway, PD is pituitary dysfunction and PPID is pituitary pars intermediate dysfunction. And I'll explain what all these things mean uh, in a bit. But the pituitary is a pea-sized part of the brain located under the hypothalamus that produces several hormones. The key thing is, it's located next to the brain, and it produces a bunch of things called hormones, which are chemical signals that transmit uh, all throughout the body um, instructions to have target organs do things. The pars intermedia is Latin for the intermediate lobe, which is a specific part of the pituitary gland, and I've got a picture of that coming up. Dysfunction just means um, that something's abnormal. DYS always means that it thinks things are not normal, so instead of saying functional, you're going to say dysfunctional. And you've heard of dysfunctional families. Well, you have dysfunction of the pituitary gland. One more page of definitions, and I'll be done. ACTH, a lot of people have heard of, especially with this uh, uh, PPID or Cushing's disease, and they, they've heard about ACTH. It means adrenocorticotropic hormone, and it is a hormone produced by the pituitary that goes out to the adrenal glands, and it's the adrenals that sit next to your kidneys that produce the cortisol, which is the uh, chemical that courses through your body that we all need to survive with. Cushing's disease is named after a physician in the early 1900s, a neurosurgeon who... Um, discovered that there's a direct link between uh, cortisol and other and diseases that were occurring in the in the human and he coined the term um, or he described the syndrome and it was called Cushing syndrome and I'm going to be sure that you understand the difference between Cushing syndrome and Cushing's disease and I think that's where a lot of problems occur in our understandings of this of this whole issue the hypothalamus is part of the brain that starts the cycle. In any cycle, if you look at anything that has a circle, there's always a start. And I'm going to be using the example of filling water in your water bucket in your stall. At some point, water has to come into a hose and into the bucket, and then the horse drinks it, and then it goes back into the earth and it gets this evaporating in the clouds, and then it rains again and goes in the water in the ground and it's pumped up again. So you pick a point in that cycle where it starts, and I'm saying the hypothalamus is where it starts. All right, it's just like we can say the pump starts to suck the water up. A neurotransmitter is a big word that just means that it's a chemical that's released from a, a stimulated nerve that sends a signal to a gland. So it's kind of like um, an electrical charge that is triggered, a nerve that sparks, but instead of it sparking to create a, a connection that causes a muscle to contract, it actually just goes to the end and, and sends out a chemical. And in this case, it's dopamine. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter that the hypothalamus secretes out and that goes to the pituitary and affects the pituitary and causes it to do something. And I'm going to explain to you what that dopamine does uh, in a very simplistic way. All right, now it's picture time. We've got four pictures in a row. And I'm just going to take a quick break and look over and make sure. You're having, uh, some people are having issues. Rochelle's on YouTube, and she can hear and see everything okay. Mm -hmm. Matt says some people are getting this image. Ah, and they can't. He's watching any YouTube work, slight delay, no chat. This may be something that Google has done that's changed things. Is which, Rochelle's doing it fine. Yeah. Um, and I'm surprised because no one's ever, that I know of, gone on to YouTube. So I think Google might have been changing something here. And that's always frustrating. And maybe in the future, I'm going to get out of Google and try something different. Um, but here's the good news. This is all being recorded, and you should be able to follow along with this in, in the future. You can always come back and watch this. Uh, I hope you guys don't get too, too discouraged and leave because this is a really cool um, 
a bunch of information I want to bring to you. Kath, if you wouldn't mind, just keep me updated and let me know what's going on. I will. All right. For those of you who can see this, or if you've downloaded the notes um, from the website, you'll be able to see it's the first illustration. It's an all-black page with a gray big circle on it, and that represents what the brain is. And I have a pink arch in here that is uh, where the hypothalamus lies, which is toward the bottom of the brain, and it's directly over the pituitary gland, which is this big pink dot in, in the black field that's actually outside of the brain. So we're just going to focus in that curved pink area called the hypothalamus and the pituitary that sits below it, which I've made a, a, a thin white line to, to demonstrate. And it's broken into three parts. You have the anterior lobe, and the posterior lobe, the light blue or gray and the uh, green. And in between, you have the intermediate lobe. And um, they've chosen to use Latin, and they call it the pars intermedia. And this blue line is the line that can create uh, Cushing's disease in your horse. And um, we're going to go over that for all of you who, who refuse to call it Cushing's disease, I understand. And I'm going to explain why um, you're right and why the other people aren't wrong. <laughs> Okay, okay. now in this slide, we've got the curved pink line, which is the uh, hypothalamus. And over on the right side, it says external stimuli and internal feedback. Well, this is where it all starts. Somewhere in the brain, they get a trigger, and that causes the hypothalamus to release the neurotransmitter called dopamine. And the dopamine is like brakes on your car. So, in other words, you're driving along, you start going downhill, and you apply the brakes. And that's what dopamine does. It applies the brakes and it slows this big blue line, the intermediate part of the pituitary, from producing ACTH. So it decreases ACTH production. And then ACTH production goes to the body and goes over to the adrenal glands. And that's where cortisol is produced. And then the cortisol production uh, will feed back as an internal feedback loop onto the hypothalamus. And it says, hey, we need more cortisol. So there's less dopamine secreted, and so we have an increase in ACTH production, and that increases more uh, cortisol, and then the increased cortisol comes back to the brain, feeds back, and says, uh-uh. Now, if you would think for a second, going back to that example of adding water to a water bucket and install, at some point the water bucket gets full, and you turn the valve off. Uh, another way of looking at it is look at your automatic water. As the bowl gets filled with water, the float in there shuts the valve off. And as the horse drinks, it lowers the, the float and that opens the valve and fills it up. So the level of cortisol, or level of water in this case, stays the same. Now, if there's a demand where they need more cortisol, that demand will override everything and, and force it to increase the cortisol. And cortisol is used for stress and for anti-inflammation or anti-inflammatory throughout the body. And so it's necessary. And in fact, it, it rises during the day in horses and humans who are awake during the day. And then toward the night, it tends to fall off and become less. It's a, a diurnal um, uh, effect where it's, it's higher in the day and then it gets lower at night. And then back in the morning, it, it increases again. And that is all predicated on increasing and decreasing daylight. Um, and that's one of the things that happens to the horses that have a problem uh, with their pituitary. Now, in this last and final picture that I want to show you, this big red X that I've drawn over where the dopamine is, that's where the problem occurs. For some reason, the neurons that come from this hypothalamus down to the end and secretes dopamine onto the pituitary, for some reason, and nobody knows why, these neurons fail. They degenerate, and as they degenerate, they no longer have a brake. It's like you going down the hill and you're pressing on the brake pedal and the brake pedal's not doing anything and you go faster and faster and faster. And so this ACTH production greatly increases and it causes the adrenals to greatly increase the amount of, of, of cortisol. And the cortisol comes back to feedback and says, whoa, stop, we need to stop. And the hypothalamus says, oh my gosh, go ahead and stop. Let's secrete more dopamine. But there it fails. The cycle's broken. And so we get nothing but more and more increasing cortisol production with no feedback mechanism. That's what happens. Now, as an aside, and I'll get to you a little bit later, think about this red X. This is exactly where the drug pergolide works because pergolide looks like dopamine, acts like dopamine, and it comes in from the outside and affects the pituitary and pretends that it's the, the, the neurotransmitter. 
And so in effect, it's putting the parking brake on, not the real brakes, but the parking brake, and tries to slow down this production of ACTH. That's how pergolide works. All right, so you've had a lot of information already. And now if you've never known anything about uh, ACTH or cortisol or anything else that I've talked about, you now know how the cycle works. And I want you to understand that this pituitary that's made up of these three colors, the, the gray, the blue, and the green, secrete a lot of hormones. And they even secrete something that's called a precursor that turns into even more hormones. So this little pea-sized thing at the base of your brain, the base of your horse's brain, is so critical to the, the working of everything in your body that if this thing stops working, you basically die. It is that important to us. And what's happening is this becomes enlarged. It actually grows in size. It hypertrophies. And they call it an adenoma, but I'll get to that in a second. But it's this little thing right here that's getting bigger and bigger because it's working its tail off, producing more ACTH because it's not being told to stop. It's a car going down the hill, going faster and faster and faster. Okay. Are there any questions so far? All right. All right. I just want to make sure. <clears throat> now, I, I'm going to give you 10 summaries. Uh, these summaries are just concepts and ideas that I want to go through, and then I'm done. I don't want to get into a lot of detail. I want to give you enough to understand and have a logical conversation with me or anybody else. And then we can delve into it via your questions so I can understand where you are having problems. So be sure to take some notes. Even if you don't couldn't download it, just grab a piece of paper and scratch things down or, or whatever you need to do. The first summary is... We may have a little problem with questions. If people are watching on YouTube, they can't get into the chat. All right. If so you can't be, get into yeah. to that, can you um, – you can text – how can we do this? You can text Kathy at her email, which is Kathy, K-A-T-H-Y, at theequinepractice.com, and she should be able to get all the, the text that way. Uh, you can also email her there, but um, uh, she we, it should – you should be able to text that. If you have WhatsApp, I don't know if you can run that too. And you can use WhatsApp because we use WhatsApp and we use uh, Apple's iMessage. So either way, you can get to her. Okay, summary number one, Cushing syndrome. This is in humans and not in horses. And this is where I think the first confusion point lies. This involves many causes of increased levels of cortisol in the blood, such as cancer of the adrenals or a pituitary dysfunction, or other things. But syndrome just means that there's so many causes that creates uh, uh, higher levels of cortisol. What we have to understand is when the pituitary doesn't work right and causes increased ACTH and that causes the adrenals to secrete more cortisol than we really need, that is called Cushing's disease. And so we don't use Cushing's syndrome, we don't use the word Cushing's, it's truly Cushing's disease. So that is an increase of uh, cortisol in the bloodstream caused by overproduction ACTH caused by uh, a lack of control because the pituitary is not being regulated anymore because the neurons from the um, hypothalamus are no longer being able to produce the neurotransmitter dopamine. That's what Cushing's disease is. So here's the important point. Cushing's disease in horses is secondary to a primary problem of the pituitary, what I personally call pituitary dysfunction, or PD. Now, most people aren't using pituitary dysfunction, and I promise you at the end of this seminar, if you stick around, I'm going to give you my thoughts, which are going to be completely different than anything else you've read out there, because I know I've read a ton of stuff on this in the past couple of days just to make sure it's up to speed, and nobody's talking about what I'm about to tell you. All right, but I want you to understand that if you believe that this is a pituitary dysfunction and you're calling it pituitary dysfunction or pituitary pars intermediate dysfunction, PPID, you are more correct than just saying your horse has Cushing's disease. But if they have a high ACTH that's unresponsive to the cortisol feedback mechanism, they truly have Cushing's disease. All right, summary two, <clears throat> pituitary dysfunction is a common enlargement of the whole pituitary gland. An adenoma means a tumor or growth of a gland. In this case, it's a pituitary adenoma. And I found it interesting that in human literature, they also call these an 
incidentaloma, which is a new word for me, but it just means that there's just an incidental finding. And in fact, in most horses in post-mortem, they're seeing the enlarged pituitary without any overt signs. More horses have pituitary adenoma than show it uh, when they're alive. So the fact that fact alone tells me two things. One, I don't know what normal is. And I don't think there's anybody who knows what normal is. And that's one of those things that you should put a little asterisk next to. What is normal for your horse? And two, is it really that important? If so many horses have it, is this something that's been brought on from a chronic um, condition, either chronic excess of something or chronic deficiency of something? But whatever it is, something is affecting these horses where a lot of horses come into the postmortem room with swollen pituitary glands without any signs. So I just want you to understand that it affects the anterior, in, intermediate, and posterior lobes. And all of those are secreting all different types of hormones. And we're getting dysfunctions that we may not even recognize now. Uh, but one of the things that we are seeing is the higher cortisol levels. And I'll tell you why that's important and confusing and frustrating and really insignificant as far as I'm concerned. But that's just my opinion. All right. Um, Let's see. Oh, yeah, the point number three down here, the several issues from a pituitary uh, dysfunction gives various similar signs to many other diseases leading to confusion by horse owners, and that's what I want to get into. Okay, number three. There are other reasons for an increased level of ACTH and cortisol in the blood, including stress, environment, and season. We all know that it rises uh, during the day and falls at night. It also rises toward the beginning of autumn in the northern hemisphere and falls toward springtime. It also knows that it rises from stress, such as overcrowding, uh, change in environment, shipping, uh, the uh, long periods of heat, long periods of cold, uh, hurricanes, all sorts of things can cause a cortisol level to rise. And is it dangerous? Is it bad? I'm not sure, but there is. It's a test that they, that they can do to tell us if the feedback mechanism is working or not, if your horse has Cushing's disease. But signs attributed to Cushing's disease, or CD, can also be caused by other conditions, including a parasite infection, chronic protein deficiency, chronic inflammation, equine metabolic syndrome, or EMS, and certainly insulin resistance, IR. There's plenty of people who believe that horses with pituitary adenomas, or PPID, uh, may be more susceptible to insulin resistance. But a lot of you guys don't even know what insulin resistance is, and it gets confusing because you think that if your horse has Cushing's, it will have insulin resistance and it will have laminitis, and that is just not true. If your horse has insulin resistance, then he is most likely susceptible to laminitis. Now, whether the horse with PPID is also going to have uh, laminitis, is we can't correlate the two. But I want to overlay all of this. Let's pretend your horse um, has insulin resistance and he's prone to laminitis. He's been a little ouchy. You aren't sure. You've taken rated graphs. There's no rotation, but you're suspicious. It's heading that way. And so you do a Cushing's test and it comes back positive. What's the overlying factor? What's causing all of this? And that's the question that if you step back far enough and you start asking, you're going to find out that nobody's asking that question. Nobody's even trying to answer that question. And I believe, because I've been with horses for over 40 years, 43 years to be exact, and I've seen the progression of increase in this pituitary dysfunction, not that that's what we called it, but I've seen the old horses, I've seen the top line start to diminish and get worse even in younger horses, meaning 15 years old. They don't, they're no longer like 25, 30 years old. I'm seeing old horses at, as early as 15. I'm seeing horses that are chronically inflamed from other reasons that look like just horrible. They're just not healthy at all. And I'm suspicious that we are doing something in our environment that's producing the uh, inflammation that's going on that's causing increase in cortisol, that's causing um, the uh, degeneration of the neurons, that's causing a lot of these things, it's causing insulin resistance. And we're all trying to lump it together with one nice little package that we could give a drug to that will prevent this all from happening. I'm going to tell you right now, that's not the case. There's no vet out there who can give you a pill 
or a, a, a condition or a treatment that's going to cure you or your horse, I should say. Uh, it's just not happening. And my contention is, and hopefully by the end of this program, you're going to realize that if you want to change your horse and get him on the right path, there's things you should be doing now before you start seeing all these signs that hopefully will prevent the horse from doing things um, that are adverse to them in the future. Unfortunately, nobody's doing it. There's no research. Nobody's wanting to do research on it, and nobody's going to be able to help you with this. But let me stop for a second and tell you what insulin resistance is. Insulin resistance is basically the UPS driver comes to your door, knocks on your door, say, I have a package for you. You're inside your house, which is basically you're, you're the cell, if you will, the, the cell that makes up all the parts of our bodies. And insulin is the UPS driver, and the package is sugar. And so he knocks on the door, and you send your uh, guy to the front door. We'll call him uh, glucose transport mechanism for something catchy nice catchy name and glucose transport mechanism comes to the door and receives the package of sugar from the UPS driver and the UPS driver known as the insulin molecule goes away and everything's done well what happens when the UPS driver is knocking on the door he's got another package of sugar and you're filled with sugar you don't want any more packages you're done you're not going to go to the door and answer it that's what insulin resistance is it's the cells inability to take that sugar molecule from the insulin molecule. And so the insulin continues to go around with sugar attached to it, and you have high levels of sugar uh, in your bloodstream. You have high levels of insulin because the insulin's not allowed to go back because it's still busy carrying the package around. And that's basically what insulin resistance is. It has nothing to do with Cushing's, nothing to do with pituitary adenomas. It is definitely has something to do with laminitis. And they've been able to pretty much connect those two together. And equine metabolic syndrome, one clear difference for equine metabolic syndrome is you can give a shot of dexamethasone, which is basically cortisol in a needle, and you can immediately drop the ACTH levels down to nothing because the feedback mechanism is working. The hypothalamus is talking to the pituitary and saying, hey, I got your message. We're going to stop ACTH production. Boom. The next day, it's gone. That's metabolic syndrome. Marilyn, question. Oops. What happened? I went to the wrong spot. Okay, Marilyn, isn't there data now to show removing grain from horses' diet improves the readings of horses on the wrong path? Oh, you're after my heart there, Marilyn. You have no idea. Um, I am, uh, if you know me at all, uh, you know that I do not think grain belongs in a horse's diet in any way, shape, or form. And this means any kind of grain. Grain to me is uh, corn, oats, uh, barley, um, wheat, wheat middlings, wheat byproducts, uh, oat byproducts. Uh, I don't believe sugar beet belongs in there. All these things have a degree of sugar, and I believe in some horses, sugar is very inflammatory. And I have a whole dissertation. If you go to the horsesadvocate.com forward slash grain, horsesadvocate.com forward slash grain, G-R-A-I-N, you're going to see my whole discussion on that. And hopefully by tomorrow night, you're going to see my updated uh, protein uh, uh, dissertation about why I think most horses have a chronic deficiency in protein, which I believe is at the root of most of the problems that we're having with horses from lameness to this PPID to many other things, uh, poor top lines, etc., and, and pot bellies. Um, and I think uh, I make a pretty good case about it. And unfortunately, if you go there right now, it's not there. Um, I've almost finished it. Um, I've just been busy putting this webinar together. So I promise you I'll get it up there tomorrow sometime. But um, yeah, stop feeding grain. Uh, and I've got, I, I laugh at the idea that people are feeding a low starch grain. Uh, to me, a Twinkie is a Twinkie. If you feed half a Twinkie or half a candy bar or half a, a, a soda pop or half a, a ice cream bar, you are getting half the calories, but you're still getting the sugar. The idea is it's not the calories, folks. It's not the calories. What it is is it's the inflammation from the sugar. And just like there are some people who have some sensitivities to um, wheat gluten, uh, some of you guys can eat a whole pizza pie and breadsticks and everything else and have no problem. Another person has one bite of something with wheat gluten in it, and they swell up. They have uh, stunted growth. They have um, menstrual problems. They have uh, uh, young girls uh, don't develop uh, uh, and turn into women. 
Uh, same with guys, you have broken bones in young children, all sorts of things that occur from wheat gluten, and that's all just inflammation. They're allergic to one part of the wheat, and, and I think we're crazy to think that some horses aren't as allergic to some of these grains, and there's one real simple way you can prove it. Take your horse off grain for two weeks and write down all your observations from being girthy to um, not want to be brushed to not want to get on a trailer to uh, crow hopping or just not being happy, being ridden to running off with you as you ride the horse uh, to non-sweaters. There's, there's a really cool thing. If your horse isn't sweating, you should try not feeding grain. There's a horse right now down in Rio who's competing for the United States equestrian team who was at wit's end because she couldn't get her horse to sweat and she had tried everything. And I said to her, well, have you thought about, oh, no grain? And she said within three days of taking her horse off grain, her horse started to sweat again and now sweats normally. And now everybody in the barn is off grain. It was an eye opener for her. Oh, we are. Yeah. Um, yeah, sorry. I got to kind of stay on topic because they only have a limited time here. Um, the method of check for insulin resistant horse, starving them overnight and doing the test. How is that valid for horses since all sorts of other stresses happen to horses? Uh, well, for insulin uh, resistance, the, um, withholding um, uh, all food from about 8 or 10 o'clock at night and then in the next morning uh, doing a um, uh, what they call a, a pre-sample and then give Carolite syrup, L-I-T-E, not L-I-G-H-T but L-I-T-E and giving I think it's 15 um, uh, mLs per 100 kilograms of body weight. Uh, you give that, which is about a couple ounces and um, if you um, then take another blood sample 60 to 90 minutes later, and you look for the um, insulin levels. That will tell you if your horse has insulin resistance. Yeah, but she's saying is it valid since the horse is quite stressed anyway? Uh, no, it is valid. It's a very valid test because it, it, it's we're not measuring for cortisol. We're measuring for insulin. So the stress won't have any effect on that. But I'm only in summary number three. And Marilyn, I've got to keep going here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we're tied up to two teratinomas. Uh, and insulin resistance does get confusing. I mean, this is a perfect example. We sit there and we say, but my horse has fatty pockets all over. He's probably got that equine metabolic syndrome and um, Cushing's. Well, they're not related. They're two completely separate diseases with similar uh, looks. Uh, insulin resistance has a laminitis. Well, so does PPID, but PPID probably has a horse that's prone to laminitis through insulin resistance, but they don't go hand in hand. Two completely, three completely different diseases. And same with uh, protein deficiency and um, uh, parasites. Um, they're all going to debilitate the animal and cause stresses, which is going to raise the cortisol levels anyway. All right, <clears throat> the test for... Uh, uh, Cushing's disease should not be run unless there are signs for bacterial dysfunction. I think everybody pretty much agrees with that. There is no test out there that can tell you that your horse is going to have a pituitary dysfunction. There's very few tests out there that are will give you accurate test results um, if it's in the early stages. Uh, so it'll basically say it's negative when in reality you're starting to have a dysfunction going on. But there are basically two primary, pr preliminary tests for Cushing's disease and each have their limitations. So let me go over them. The first is the overnight dexamethasone suppression test. Not to be confused with the test that Marilyn just asked about where you um, are looking for carolite and looking for an increase in insulin because you gave it a dose of sugar. Here, you come at, uh, the vet comes in in the afternoon, draws a blood sample, find out what the base rate is, and then the next day, oh, and then gives a dose of dexamethasone, which is basically cortisol in a bottle. So you're going to dose the horse the cortisol, it's going to be circulating around. In a normal horse, that cortisol, 18 hours later, is going to take the ACTH and drop it to zero, or less than one. Let's put it that way. And a horse that doesn't have that feedback mechanism is going to have a huge spike. I think it's over 29. <clears throat> the problem is, in early stages of PD, you're not going to have a um, you're going to have a false negative, which means uh, it says, "Hey, you don't have the problem." In reality, it's starting to occur. But there's a couple problems. One, uh, it's poorly repeatable. So you do it in a horse, and it comes up with an answer, and then you do it again a month later, six months later, and th it's going to be different. And that's because there are so many other varying factors that affect how the horse responds to cortisol, and there may be some other factors that are affecting the, um, uh, the release of dopamine. 
So there are so many factors that we just don't know about. And there's plenty of very, very intelligent veterinarians who are working hard to get the, these answers and trying to clear it up. But from my perspective, what's the point? Because just because your horse has a high level of cortisol in there, the horse seems to be able to handle that. These other diseases are coming from other things. And yes, a high level of cortisol could potentiate or exacerbate these other things. And if you are having a horse with laminitis, it's a good idea to reduce the cortisol. I don't argue that. But if all your horse has is a good, happy face, he looks healthy, he's running around, his hair coat's having a little bit of problem shedding, but he's doing fine, he's 30 years old, slow down, everybody. Let's not have a panic attack. This horse is going to probably do just fine until he dies from other natural causes. And by the way, a lot of people are afraid of giving dexamethasone to a horse that may be prone to laminitis. I don't blame you. I've seen it. I've heard of it. It happens all and over. Uh, Although not every horse that gets dexamethasone can get laminitis. So uh, that's one of the biggest drawbacks of doing a dexamethasone suppression test. So you have to give them a whopping dose of dexamethasone and your horse uh, may have founder the next day. So you got to be careful of that. This is, I think, why a lot of veterinarians go to the plasma ACTH concentration test. This uh, <clears throat> has a lot of false positives that are due to regional and seasonal differences. For instance, if you're in the early fall in New York, and you do this, you're going to come back with, with a high positive. But if you're down in Alabama, that same horse may not have a positive. Um, and if you move the horse from New York to Florida, let's say, that could change everything. So for some reason, the change uh, in seasons, uh, whether you're up here or down in the southern hemisphere, it changes things. So most laboratories who are testing for ACTH in the horse had devised a, a method to adjust for the season, for the month that blood test was taken in, and where they're located. So they basically compile all their samples and figure out what really is normal for horses that time of year in their location. So if you're taking a blood test here and then you take a blood test because your horse has moved to Florida or to New York or to California or to Venezuela or someplace else, um, it may be totally whacked out. You really don't know what normal is for your horse. So there's a big uh, difference for that. I think all the vets know that if you do an ACTH test and it comes back way over 29, just way off the charts, there's probably a, a problem going on in the pituitary. But again, look at the horse and see if there's any signs. Because remember, the pituitary secretes a bunch of hormones, and one of them could be that your horse has diabetes insipidus. Now, well, let me before I get into that, let me let me continue on to summary seven. I'll get into that in a second. <clears throat> okay. What I was saying was, if your horse has uh, pituitary dysfunction, it's usually not a life-threatening illness, and the horse usually no, doesn't show any discomfort. <clears throat> However, if they are life-threatening, uh, it could be exacerbated, uh, especially in immune suppression or laminitis. So if your horse has chronic infections, it would be a good idea to treat for pituitary dysfunction, specifically cortis um, Cushing's disease, by uh, giving the pergolide and trying to get that under control. <clears throat> Uh, and that's something I would do. But if your horse is fat and happy and he's you know, 20, 25, 30 years old and things seem to be going well, I would be working more on the nursing things. The critical care is one thing, but I would be doing the nursing things. For instance, changing the diet, eliminating the grain, trying to analyze the protein that your horse is getting. Get better quality protein and make sure he's getting all the essential amino acids so it can build and repair all the muscles that are causing the top line to disintegrate. Make sure that neurons are working firing properly and all these other things. <clears throat> so the bottom line is summary number seven. Adding a treatment for pituitary dysfunction is not a panacea. You're not going to give pergolite and have all your problems in your horse go away. It is just an adjunct therapy of what I feel is not really a lot of consequence. Yes, it is true. Horses that get on pergolite can improve their looks, but what else are you doing besides that? And I'll bet you it's the other things that you're doing with these horses, not just the pergolite, but changing the diet away from sugar, adding a protein source such as soybean or whey protein to these horses, and, and giving them a year, and you're going to see some changes that may or may not be related to the pergolite. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> medication for uh, um, pituitary dysfunction includes pergolide and seprohepatine. Now, when I first started off, seprohepatine was the only drug, and it indirect, indirectly decreased the ACTH production, and it didn't do it as well as pergolide, 
And that's why they found Pertilide, which used to be a human drug, which has been taken off the market uh, in the human world, but now is a <clears throat> uh, valid drug uh, in the horse world through Percent. Um, and that acts like dopamine to inhibit the production of ACTH, as I showed you in that um, picture a little while back. <clears throat> but again, I can't overemphasize the fact that you may be giving Pergolide, but if you aren't doing the other treatments, uh, and, and if your horse isn't really showing any signs, then don't worry about it. And some of the signs that I'm talking about um, are hypertrichosis. It used to be called hirsutism. Uh, they've changed it to hypertrichosis, which you and I would know as a long curly hair coat. That d that's coat C-O-A-T. In fact, I can change that right now. Oh, cool. Hair, H-A-I-R. <laughs> so, okay. Hair coat, and it doesn't shed. And it's pathognomonic for PD. Pathognomonic is a big word I tend to like. It means if you got long curly hair coat, then your horse has a pituitary dysfunction. It goes hand in hand. You can't have a long curly hair coat that doesn't shed and not have pituitary adenoma. They're not recognizing the fact that there's increasing daylight in the springtime, and so the hair coat doesn't shed. But I will tell you, I, I start laughing, and, and I try not to. When I have a horse owner say, I think my horse has Cushing's, and immediately my hackles are up because they didn't say Cushing's disease or pituitary adenoma, uh, and I say to them, why? And they say, well, my horse's hair coat is really thick and long. And I say, it's November, and we're in New York. It better have a long hair coat. And, and they kind of smile and they realize because it's the fact that they cannot shed it. If March, April, May comes, June comes, and they still have this long woolly hair coat, that's a pituitary adenoma. And <clears throat> you can give all the pergolide you want, but if you aren't getting your clippers out there and shaving the hair off this horse and giving it baths to get all the sweat that this horse is having because he's overheated because they've got the long hair coat on, then you're not treating the horse properly. You have to do the nursing care. I also like to talk di about diabetes insipidus, which is an anterior lobe uh, dysfunction where they um, basically uh, have an antidiuretic hormone dysfunction that causes the kidneys to urinate a copious amounts of almost water. It's not concentrated at all. And horses with uh, diabetes insipidus <clears throat> will have a pool of water in their stall. It's disgusting, but it doesn't and smell because it's basically water and they're drinking three or four buckets that I see hanging on the wall because the horse can't get enough because it's drinking I mean it's peeing everything it drinks it right out that's diabetes insipidus that's a horse that should be on pergolide there's no doubt about it if you have a horse that's got a long haircut it should be on pergolide you should be doing everything for that you can to help reduce the um, uh, secretion of ACTH and other things because the dopamine does more than just ACTH. It also helps shrink the, the adenoma and, and normalize other functions. So <clears throat> that's important. But if your horse has lethargy, poor hair coat, <clears throat> loss of a top line, infertility, mammary gland development in some horses, <clears throat> well, that's not pathognomonic. That means it could be related to some other disease. Um, lethargy is he's just overworked. Uh, poor hair coat could be parasites. Loss of top line could be a uh, protein deficiency. Infertility, mammary gland development could be other things. Stress related, just age. Age could be because they're not getting the right nutrients, uh, <clears throat> and they're and they're starting to get a pituitary adenoma. There's so many ifs in here, and that's why it's so confusing. There's no one set thing. And finally, uh, summary number ten is no one knows the cause of the degeneration of the neurons from the hypothalamus leading to the loss of dopamine and the dysfunction of the pituitary. Nobody knows. <clears throat> but I'm suggesting that because we don't see it until the horse is older, and when we see it, we also see a poor hair coat, chronic skin conditions, loss of top line, lethargy, no spunk, uh, a dull eye. Couldn't that be something else that's going on? Shouldn't we be addressing all those as an entity that <clears throat> could be long-term deficiency, cracked hooves, crumbling hooves, a little bit of uh, separation at, at CD toe, maybe a touch of laminitis. Couldn't that all be because you're feeding too much sugar, not enough protein, uh, not giving enough pasture, uh, or there, there's the, the list of things that could be going on is so long that the whole takeaway message from here is maybe I should be doing all these other things and try to prevent pituitary adenoma from occurring in the first place.
Because just like anything else in medicine, if you stop doing what's causing the damage, you probably won't need a treatment for it later in life. And that's where I'm coming from. So let's start to look at prevention and try to manage it in every horse we have from the foal, from the yearling, from the young horse that we've got. Even if your horse is 10 or 15 years old, if we start making changes now, we should be able to see a difference long term. And that's my challenge to each and every one of you is listening to this. Maybe you should be getting a, a notebook, a calendar, circle the date and say from this point on, I'm going to start treating the horse like a horse, like he's been raised for tens of thousands of years before he's put in captivity and start feeding like a horse, treating like a horse, and allowing the biology of the horse to actually come through. This is not frou-frou stuff. This is not being all natural and, you know, a lovey-dovey. I'm saying start treating a horse like a horse and see what happens. And you're going to have to give your horse at least six months to a year to see if there's going to be a difference. I know I've done this to my body, and I'm not losing a lot of weight, but I've never felt stronger, sharper, or clearer in thought or energized than I have since I started to replace the proteins in my life and watch what I eat. It's making a huge difference in my life, and I'm flat out excited about it. It'll be a year uh, in December. And I'm going to write a little blog about what I've gone through. And I've got several people with horses who've gone off grain and who read their testimonials or see their video testimonials on the uh, horsesadvocate.com forward slash grain and see what differences it's made. And I'm trying to get people to understand the importance of protein in the life and see if that can make a difference. So <clears throat> start today and give your horse the nutrition it needs to maintain its body and eliminate all infl inflammation and stress in the horse's life as best you can. And be willing to provide the husbandry support necessary to help these horses that do have the long curly hair coat or diabetes insipidus or have the fatty lumps or have a little bit of inflammation with their hoof. Get good farriers out there. Get a team approach together and do what you can to normalize this horse everywhere because the pituitary is a very small thing that carries the weight of the world on its shoulders. And I think if we carry some of that weight ourselves, it allows the uh, pituitary to normalize, you may find out that uh, your horse will do a lot better. All right, well, I've breezed through in 50 minutes uh, Cushing's disease and pituitary adenomas and PPID, and hopefully uh, this stimulates you to have more of a discussion. Uh, you can always become a member of the Horse Advocate. Go there now, uh, sign up. Uh, become a member. It's free. And uh, you'll also get a free PDF book called The Ten Irrefutable Laws of Horsemanship, which is a book that I wrote that I just uh, use every day. Melissa and I use this every day in our practice to approach these horses that within 30 seconds place their hand inside their mouth, place a float in their mouth, start filing their teeth 92% uh, of the time without drugs, without a speculum, without any other restraint. Um, and you can also buy from the paperback, um, from the publisher. Um, ebook or iTunes, it, you can get all that way, but just go to equinepractice.com.